Hi everyone, and uh, welcome, welcome to our talk. We're going to be talking about regression testing and automated regression testing in Drupal uh, using Scythe backstop on JS, and we're here from Evolving Web. Uh, I know it's uh, it's right after lunch, so it's uh, it's great that you're here with us. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Ngo. I'm currently working at Evolving Web as a Drupal developer. I have more than 10 years uh, experience working with Drupal, and I'm a Acquia certified grandmaster. My name is Alex Zergachev. I'm co-founder at Evolving Web. I've been doing, doing this for, for 15, 15 years now, with 14 of those 15 years in, uh, as a Drupal, a Drupal person. I started off as Evolving Web's first back-end developer and sysadmin, and, and my co-founder and, and now wife, Suzanne, was our first front-end developer. And uh, now she's moved on to be our Drupal community and Drupal practice lead, whereas I, I look up HR matters and resumes and spreadsheets more often than not. Uh, but I, I still really love uh, all the technical subjects and, and of course, uh, automating, automating uh, processes. We are a digital marketing and digital technology company. Uh, we've, we've grown over the years, so maybe many of you who know us know us as a, as a, as a Drupal-only specialist shop. But in the last couple of years, we've grown from, from 20-something to 70-something. And uh, we're doing a lot of work with higher ed, uh, government, uh, NGOs, and, and generally big, big uh, organizations that look to make a big impact on the world. Uh, some of our clients you see here, um, for university, for, uh, for Princeton especially, we did the Princeton International website last year. Before that, we did the Princeton University Press and the SPIA, SPIA, uh, that Princeton.edu site. Uh, so we are really embedded in the community, uh, as well as, uh, of course, doing lots of higher ed work. Um, Although we're a Canadian company, shh, don't tell this to the U.S. government. We actually are a vendor of record for the U.S. Senate, and we made uh, Senator John Ossoff's website last summer uh, with, with our U.S.-based uh, team members. Um, and we're doing a lot of uh, government work, especially in Canada. Um, so today we're going to talk about regression testing. So that's, uh, I'll leave that to Robert to introduce. Yeah. So you want to help in the light to go down in front here so we can read what you write. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Kevin, you took the photos. <laughs> okay, uh, so today we would like to cover the regression testing topic, and uh, we will go over the regression automated, automated testing and automated testing team, and we will go over an example of how we use it in one of our projects. Uh, yes. Uh, so first, let's talk about regression testing one of our problems that <clears throat> when we work with a Drupal project, there is a problem when we do the security update or uh, core update. We don't know if it breaks somewhere. So there comes the regression testing. It's a, a testing practice to ensure that your application, after you deploy or you change something, it doesn't break elsewhere. And uh, recurrent, um, there are two types of regression testing, which is automatic, uh, automate testing and manual testing. Before we use manual testing, like we have a, a checklist, like 50 items, you go to that page, you click that button, you expect to go to that another page, something like that. But the manual testing is very, uh, is very time consuming and it can be incorrect because of human error. So we, can't, we try to find a solution with automated testing. So with automated testing, we can use some automation testing and run your predefined test suite. And even better, you can integrate it into the CI CD system and let it run on demand or let it run on a specific on a specific time of the day. Which means you can run the test on your system every day, make sure that it's not breaking. And if if it is breaking, you get notice right away. So the benefit of automated testing, like I said, you can run it whenever you want and it's just very consistent. It's run on the cloud, you don't need to worry about the difference of the environment. It can improve bug detection, which I will go on, this, the, next, uh, on, the, on, the, on the next section. Uh, it's just reusability because the test code that you are writing for a, one website there are some parts that can be inherit and reuse on other side, especially when we work with Drupal. So you write a test on this one, and you can reuse a part of it. So that will reduce the cost to do the QA on our system. 
it's also uh, reduce the human error. Let's say you have a scenario of five or 10 steps to do. You go into this, click this, submit the form, validate something. So that needs to be very fine manually and it's very uh, easy to have an error and you can have the phone result. Um, be before we go on, I just wanted to say that everything we'll be discussing today doesn't really replace manual testing and it still should be the essence of, of what we do. Uh, in fact, most, most projects and most scenarios require regular manual testing. We, uh, as our company has grown, we've built a, a dedicated QA team and we're constantly improving and building on that. Uh, so there's a, this isn't the subject of, of, of this presentation, but obviously there's trade-offs to be considered and, and a mix of manual and automated testing is, is necessary. Of course, if you're ever working with complex projects with multi-step flows, uh, I think human error factor starts becoming more and more dominant and then you really have to write automated tests. So anything to do with multi-steps and data entry, then automated testing is irreplaceable. Yeah, thank you Alex for bringing it because when I first started doing the testing, I was thinking like we can test everything, but turn out it's not true. <laughs> so you, you can select a few features to test and make sure that it's just working well. You cannot test everything from the beginning. The test will evolve over time and more and more you will be able to cover your system more. Uh, so let's go back to the slide. Um, so in the automated testing, we, these are the kind of tests we can do, some repetitive action, some, uh, some action that can cause by the human error like submitting a form or uh, multiple step uh, validation or you can test on multiple device and viewpoint, which is very important. And that uh, point to the next, point, next, um, the next item, which is the visual regression test. So uh, for example, this is our visual regression test matrix. So let's say we want to test a website, one, one single page on three browser on different viewport, different um, screen dimension like this. We also want to cover the iPhone, the Android like this. So doing all that kind of test manually will take a lot of time and it's, it's not sustainable at all. So we come up with, now we, we try to find the automated testing tool. Uh, for automated testing tool, there are so many, many solutions already. Uh, in Drupal, we are familiar with the PHP unit, the BHAT Nightwatch.js. Uh, we also try some visual regression testing like Cypress, which is very popular. Uh, recently, we are working with Playwright, which is backed by Microsoft, and a Backstop, per CIO. Uh, and then there is one, uh, uh, one interesting tool that we develop at Evolving Web, which is Cydiff which allow you to compare the markup of the site. Great. And actually, I would add that uh, while the, the focus of this talk is on um, regression testing and the tools that we, that we will show you, uh, I wanted to mention that conceptually, unit testing is when you take little pieces of code and you, and you treat them as functions that have an input, like uh, print report card, and then have an input, maybe the student ID. And then the function is the output with a table, maybe a logical table, so not an HTML table, but with all their grades. And so you, you have sample data and you're like testing the function with these inputs. This function has to produce an output of this form and you just say input this, output expected versus output actual, and if, if not, throw an error. That is a, a unit test. An integration test is more when, when you're automating uh, the manual checking process by, by literally uh, going through the uh, the test scenarios and scripting a browser to open this web page, open this, that, wait for this form to load, fill in this field with this data, this field with that data, click submit and make sure that the message is, uh, excuse me, there's an error with this component because you know a postal or US zip code must have five digits or nine digits. Um, so that that would be an integration test, and it's an automated version of. Uh, it's not, it's, you're not testing a piece of code, you're testing the behavior of the system as a whole. And then of course the, 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 the regression testing is what we're getting to is, is like before and after should be the same because we did some security updates and this shouldn't have broken anything. So regression is all about other bugs that pop back up like that, that we want to make sure they never come back on a continuous basis. And so this is a little bit different again. You want to continue? Yeah. So 
Uh, I think it's used though. Yeah. Uh, so today we would like to discuss about like a very specific uh, scenario. Like you run a car update, and then you take a snapshot of the site. You deploy the code, take another snapshot, compare to see if there is any different. And if that if that different is okay, you go let it pass. If not, you go and check what you did. That's it. And the snapshot, the term snapshot in this case will be referred as the screenshot of the page or uh, the markup of the page, depend on the tools that you are using to test. Uh, so let's talk about automation <coughs> testing tools. So there are so many tools on, uh, on the internet. <laughs> so we have three of them that we use quite often. Uh, the first one is Sidiff, uh, Backstop, and Playwright. So let's talk about Sidiff. Great. Thank you. I'll, I'll do the keyboard yeah. here. Uh, so Sidiff is a, is a tool that we created ourselves. Uh, the use case was uh, we do a lot of higher ed content work and migrations. And you know, typically, you have, you have either a single website with hundreds or thousands of pages, or even like families of websites for different departments and organizations. And if you, if you want to do a, you know, a Drupal 8 to 9 upgrade, uh, how are you going to test all 10,000 pages that, uh, that you nominally didn't break by, by changing a lot of the code. And then, for, of course, you manually test uh, 10, 50, 100 pages, maybe 100 of the most representative ones and, and the most important ones. But at some point, we needed to, to say, how can we track things in an automated way? And what we were inspired by was uh, tools like Site Improve, which many in the higher ed space use religiously. Uh, and that's, if you haven't heard of it, it's a crawler like Google that goes and visits every single page and on your server, downloads it, and then analyzes the HTML. For what Site Improve does is it's an accessibility checker. So it goes and validates every single page's accessibility stuff. Uh, what we were doing was regression testing. So we, we decided that we we're going to take a, a snapshot of every page before and after, and we're going to compare an HTML diff of the page and make sure that nothing changed. This is in contrast to the other tools that we'll be discussing that take screenshots and, and then compare to make sure that the screenshots don't change. And there's pros and cons uh, to both approaches. The reason that we wanted to use the, the diff tool is because in our projects, a lot of use cases actually change, change something about the page but we want to say ignore this section or ignore this or modify it somehow. So we, we, we hypothesized that using a markup based diff was, was more relevant for us. And there was a, some pros and cons that I can discuss. Uh, so it, it does the crawl, it does the diff, and it does a nice report. Uh, I personally like Ruby, and so did a couple of our developers at the time. So we wrote this as a, as a crawler in Ruby. Uh, the typical uh, use cases that we were supporting was deploying uh, your website that already exists in dev to staging, or that already exists in staging to production. So nominally, every single thing should change. But maybe a different version of PHP uh, is breaking some line of custom PHP code in a custom module that uh, you don't access unless you, uh, you you crawl every page. And so maybe you missed it. Uh, similarly, for security updates, so this is a little bit different because you're not comparing left like like before. Uh, in this environment and this URL and then after at this at this URL instead of security update is, is usually here is the site you crawl it take a snapshot of that then you run the security update in place and then and just rerun the crawl again and compare before and after so that's a common use case um, we realize that when we're doing uh, Drupal 7 to 8 or Drupal 7 to 9 migrations uh, it's really like build a, a similar but not entirely same site and then run, use the migrate API in Drupal to create a massive content migration. And so here we're not testing that every single page should look the same or even have all the same content organized in the same way. There, for that use case, we, we, we focus on a subset of a page to say just the body text is fine or just these fields and these CSS selectors that target them. Uh, make sure that those don't change. So, so we've modified this open source tool that we maintain ourselves uh, to, to capture use case, uh, this use case. And then finally, we, have, uh, we haven't actually uh, done, done this, but we have the ambition to, to create a, a workflow around this tool for continuous integration so that we can create diffs and reports of the sort I'm about to show you uh, in a, in a, like on every commit you create this. So for the, for the use case of uh, uh, comparing two sites, I, I, I demonstrate the command here. You run 
site diff init, it's a command line tool, sorry for all of you non-command line people, uh, site diff init, uh, the old URL, the new URL, you know, the, the test URL, the prod URL, whatever you want to think of it as, and it'll generate the report. Or another uh, scenario is we, we want to work on a dev site in place, so we do site diff init on nothing. It, it does an initial crawl, then we do a site diff crawl again to, to once you've confirmed what you want to do, it downloads all the pages. Uh, site diff diff actually goes and generates the report, and then uh, if you ever change the site and you want to iterate again and again because you rolled something back or you did another security update, you can rerun the crawl by running site diff store. Uh, it also caches, so you know the thing that you had the stable version before is going to get cached to speed up the crawls. Um, I think I'll skip this slide. So here's a here's a screenshot of what uh, what it looks like when you run site diff diff, and uh, it, it pops up a report uh, that that shows you all the paths that it crawled, and there's a YAML file that gets generated, so you, if you want, you can work only with a subset of these paths. Uh, sometimes that, that's important in our workflow. And then it shows you, is there any change, or was there even a 404 error when you try to visit one of them? Uh, and of course, there's a URL for the, in this case, in the screenshot, you can see the URL is from before and after. Uh, and these are two different, uh, two different sites. Um, there's also a little bit of filtering UI, as you can see. And uh, if you click through a page with a change, you're going to see uh, a colored diff like this. I'm sure you've seen lots of them for code. This is for the HTML code. Uh, we set this up. It was actually pretty easy to build. I mean, you know, it was the kind of thing that we thought, hey, we can build this in a weekend. Uh, but then there was a catch. The catch is on dynamic websites like, like that are powered by CMS like Drupal, uh, we have uh, a lot of spurious HTML diffs that we couldn't possibly care about but that, that are random form build IDs or random cache busting tokens for images, you know, to make sure that the images reload all the time. And so we very quickly realized that we had, in this, in this phase, we had everything changed all the time just because of how Drupal is kind of dynamic and how it works, even if nothing changed, if, even if it didn't run the security update. So then we had to create a, uh, a workflow for ourselves. And it's a little bit of work, but we find it's still worth doing. And we have to set this up for every, every project, but we can reuse, uh, this, is, this is in YAML syntax, and we create these standardization rules. And if you, if you squint a little bit and, and see what I'm showing, uh, these are kind of regular expression type syntax with a pattern and the thing to replace that removes the dynamic element. So it's a find and replace set of patterns that we run in order to get rid of the spurious dynamic content. It's a bit of work, but I mean, so manual QA is also a bit of work and then it gives, sets you up for repeatedly running the test and then having a clean diff. Uh, at some point, we also added support for uh, what we were calling DOM transforms, or basically CSS, jQuery style transformations in order to uh, work not with uh, the text of the HTML, but with a parsed XML document. And then we can, we have a transformation of the type remove a wrapper, which means if there's a div with a, with an article class, I think, or actually an, an, an article tag in this case, uh, just remove the wrapper tag, the article tag, and keep the content. Or the second example on the bottom is um, I don't want any, uh, any divs. I want to remove the classes of the form class bar, class buzz. So you just, you just uh, are able to compare things that you think should be the same, but when you look at the diff in raw mode, it was different. Um, so that actually works fine, and we use it all the time uh, for the use cases I said. For the, uh, for the migration, uh, like Drupal 7 to 8 or 7 to 9, uh, we needed to be able to specify the regions in which the diff happens, where we basically throw away every piece of HTML except in the specified regions, again, being provided by, uh, by a CSS selector. You see the h1.title in there. Um, and we can have like multiple pieces that we fish out and create a new document to diff. So that's why there's a, the regions is an array. In this case, we're taking two pieces, the title of the page and the contents of the body field. And we just want a, a report showing the diffs there because anything broader than that, and there was gonna be too many spurious diffs. And uh, that, that actually worked for us too. And, uh, and so that's, that's the tool. Uh, I'll give you some screenshots. Here's the GitHub uh, page. It's an open source project. And, and we have a nice blog post about it that goes in a little bit more detail uh, with crawling frequencies and pass password support and, and all the stuff that we needed in real life. So thanks, uh, th thanks for checking it out. Uh, and then the second, uh, the second tool is Backstop.js. Uh, full disclosure, not, 
uh, disclosure, neither Robert nor I ever touched it or know much about it, but it's quite popular and, uh, and we know it's important, so I insisted that we're going to cover it briefly in this presentation. Our colleague Kevin in the back, uh, I believe he even wrote a blog post about how you used it for, for some projects of ours, so I assure you, very smart people use this tool, it's quite effective, it's arguably maybe a more community supported robust version of what we're doing with uh, site diff, but it works on a screenshot basis. If, if, you're, if someone's taking pictures, you can take a picture of the, of the URL for where you can get more data about what Backstop.js is, but it's, it's all on, on GitHub, and it has a great readme. Thank you. Uh, and um, basically, you create a, a JSON file. In our case, it was YAML file because SiteDiff was made a little while ago. You create a JSON file to configure it. The, the things to point out is here are the, 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 the sizes of screenshots I want to take of my pages uh, in the... You can write JavaScript because you're scripting a browser, so you can write custom JavaScript to transform the pages however you want, uh, which is nice. And then here you have uh, the scenarios um, scenarios list, which includes the most important parameter, the URL you want to take a screenshot of. Uh, as far as I know, it doesn't crawl, but Kevin, does it crawl, or do you have to manually put in a scenario for every page you test? I don't remember. I think it has an option to crawl, but I'm not super sure. Okay, so so maybe it doesn't crawl. You have to you manually specify it, but in, in many cases that's that's not such a big deal. Um, and so once you do get the report, it looks a little bit like this, which is for every single screenshot that it took, it shows you the reference, which is the, what I call the before, and the test, which is the after. And depending on how you use its user interface, you can say, don't just show me the before and the after. Show me the the a visual overlay diff. And it also has the scrub mode where you can, you know, you, you guys have seen this, where you can drag it around left and right so you can visually tell. Uh, so people really appreciate this tool and uh, it has the benefit of being more robust to spurious HTML differences, so which is why I, I think I endorse you trying this tool. But it's very hard to customize if you, if you actually have meaningful differences that, that visually pop up, it's very difficult to transform them. Although, of course, you see that the before and after scripts, you can, do, you can still do things with the various transformations to get rid of them visually. Um, another, another interesting feature that I noted is that it has an approval workflow, kind of like SiteImprove does, that you can say, this is a difference that I accept, so from now on, stop complaining about it. So that was uh, Backstop, very briefly, as, as much as we know about it. Uh, but uh, Robert would like to take the balance of the presentation to talk about Playwright. Yeah. <clears throat> another tool that we are working with is Playwright. And uh, interesting enough, uh, so uh, Backstop, now the latest version is built on top of Playwright. So. What is Playwright? Uh, Playwright is a tool to support you build the end-to-end -end te regression testing, and it is backed by Microsoft. Uh, it supports you to test on different browsers, like the Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and the mobile browser. Like the visual uh, regression testing matrix that you see above, it's done by Playwright. And another thing is uh, written in TypeScript, so your code will be much better. <laughs> and uh, okay, so with Playwright, uh, it's an all-in-one toolkit. So for example, if you work with Test Cafe before, you can test a scenario, a different scenario. If you want to test the visual testing, you need to add a plugin. If you test an API, you need to add another plugin. So in Playwright, everything is in one package and it's ready to use. It is um, supported by a strong community. So it's just really good. Uh, it's also support uh, multiple type of it's also support uh, multiple type of report. Uh, for example, the HTML report, the lie report, or the dot report, which will be useful when you run it on the CI system. So uh, here's the very basic command of Playwright. Uh, so if you, ha you want to run on the scenario, you can run NPX Playwright test, or if you want to run it on a specific uh, scenario that in this case, it will be the scenario for the homepage. It will be like that. On the right-hand side, you can see the basic uh, structure of the test folder. I have one. Yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, there is one thing with Playwright. Uh, so Playwright support visual regression testing. And if you run all the test on the first time, unlike like Cydiff, where do the crowd, you need to tell it to crowd the visual, the screenshot manually by 
setting one specific flag. So this is the message that you see when you, uh, when you don't set it. But if you run it with the update snapshot, it will create and store the snapshot at that stage of the site. This will be useful on the next step that I will show you later. So uh, now we come to the, an example in one of our projects. So there are a few problems in this project. So we want to test a specific user workflow. And we will also want to test a form submission. So this is the screenshot of our project. In this project, uh, in the home page, if you have if you if you select you come from Quebec, you should be able to see the insurance code on the right hand side. But if you come from Ontario, you should not see that. And we want to test it and make sure that it's on way like that. So our test scenario is like you go to the home page as an anonymous user, you should see this. And if you change the province, you should not see the block anymore. It's very simple. <laughs> so this is an example of the code that we wrote for, for that, that scenario. Uh, this is written with uh, Playwright. As you can see, it's very simple. For the test of select FR and QC, and you will perform context switching into French and Quebec. And then you expect to see that block to be visible and expect the current site to be the base URL and slash FR. But if you switch into English, you should not see that block anymore, and the URL need to match the EN. A second, um, a second test case that we perform, which is for, the, for this uh, simple form, uh, on the left-hand side, you have three options where you can select the postal code of your home, or you can search by name, or you can search by the postal code of the workplace. And the right-hand side, it will be the keyword, which is the postal code. So in this, in this uh, scenario, in this form, we just want to perform a very basic test case, which is if you submit a valid, a valid postal code, it should show more than one result. And if you submit with something like ho, 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 it should not show any result. And if you try to search with a US postal code, sorry, we don't cover it, so it should not show, um, the, it should show the, the validate message. Uh, so this is how we uh, perform it. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I just want to point out, in case you guys don't know, ho, ho, ho is a valid Canadian postal code, not just because it's letter, digit, letter, digit, letter, digit, but because it was special cased in to cover the North Pole. <laughs> yeah. so, so you know. But in this case, we are looking for somebody in the system, but there's nobody in the system <laughs> staying in that postal code. So no, zero, no zero result. So. Uh, the, task, the test that we need to write to cover all the three, as you can see, is fairly simple. And for example, test with a valid postal code. What we need to do, the first line, it will be await, uh, okay, await, and find an advisor and perform the search. And you submit the value that you want to put in there and expect the result to be uh, as you want here. So what is the perform search do? The perform search is basically go to that page, get the select, uh, the select list of the search type and provide the search type that you put in there, enter the keyword that you want to search, and then submit the form by clicking it. That's it. So there are a few problems with, um, uh, with this. So when we run multiple test scenario, it takes a lot of time to run. And we need to decide when is the best time to run it uh, do we want to get a developer to stay there and run it from time to time? No. So we, we want to put it on a CI, and we can either schedule it to run it on a specific time of the day, or you can trigger it to run using a command line from somewhere. It can be done using GitLab CI or Bitbucket Pipeline. So this is an example of our test on Bitbucket Pipeline. Uh, we just push it and configure it to run when we want. And as you can see, there is the result here. So we have 20 uh, test scenario that run on uh, different days. <coughs> so for example, in this case, we are, we are testing the file advisor page with a valid postal code, with an invalid postal code, a non-assist postal code. So, and all of this is say check, 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 which means on good. Uh, so that is the first problem that we try to tackle, we try to tackle the behavior that the user will, will do on the site. 
So the second problem is we want to do visual regression testing. Like Alex mentioned before, we want to take a snapshot of the, the site, take on a screenshot of each and every page, store it somewhere, do the core update, and then run the snapshot again to compare to see if there is any different. So uh, this is an example that I put in here. Uh, it's very easy to do it with Playwright. So first we put the URL here, which is an array, and then we look through each array and run go to this page, take a screenshot, and expect that screenshot to match the previous snapshot. So imagine that you have the, 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 the array here. You can either put it manually or you can crawl it from the site, sitemap.xml of, um, of Drupal site and then use some simple JavaScript to turn it into an array. <clears throat> so this is the result. Uh, so we are testing the white Drupal page of Evolving Web. So it's showing, okay, we are uh, download the, we are creating the screenshot of Chrome and the mobile Safari. And then if you want, you can see the report by uh, typing this command. So uh, this is what is happening behind the scene. So initially we have the report, the, the test report like this. And then when you run NPX Playwright test, it will create these three folder, the Playwright report, the snapshot, and the test result. The snapshot here is configurable. You can put it anywhere you want. Uh, so in this here, this is the, the, pay, the page where you see the report on the previous slide. And these are the snapshot that we have. Uh, take a look in here, the, name, the naming convention of the screenshot. It say Chromium and Darwin here because I run it on my MacBook. If you run it on, um, if you run it on a Linux, it will say Linux in here. So that will cause another problem that we will discuss later. So there are two problems, there are three problems with this one. So the first one, if you run the visual regression test on a hundred page, it will take a lot of time to generate each and every screenshot of it. And then the screenshot naming convention is OS specific, like I mentioned before. And three, we don't want to put on the screenshot in the Git repo. We want to store the snapshot and share with on the developer to, to have the consistent result, but we don't want to put it in Git because it's so heavy. There is a workaround with the Git large file storage, uh, but I don't really like that solution. I, so, be I believe the phrase is workaround. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we try to come up with another solution. <laughs> yeah. So the solution for the problem of the problem to in here. <laughs> So we use the CI to run all of this. And uh, when, whenever it runs, it's not blocking any developer. And it has a specific OS environment. Like I only run it on the Linux runner, so it's the same. And we also uh, can keep track on the historical snapshot if we want. So how does it go? So remember, we have the folder structure like this, and all of three folders like here. We don't need to store it in our Git repo. We can exclude it. Why? Because in we design a CI system so that when we want to generate or update snapshot, we tell it to spin up the runner and run the test with the, the flag update snapshot. And then we upload on the snapshot to the AWS. In this case, we are uploading there a snapshot folder, the Playwright report to the uh, AWS. And then when we want to compare snapshot, we, we run different tasks, spin up the, the runner, and then we fetch the previous snapshot, run the test without the update snapshot, and then we will see the report. So how does it go? So this is my uh, snapshot of my um, AWS uh, S3, where I store on the report in here. So as you can see, I'm starting to folder here. And in this folder, uh, the snapshot, as you can see, it has the, in, we have the visual and the page. This is the test for uh, the, the page. This is the, the test file, it's just the naming convention. And here we have the two uh, screenshot that we take. And we can have the report, which is a very simple HTML file and it will be accessible on this link if you want to share it on the, the team. So how does it fit in our uh, development 
ecosystem, which is we at Evolving Web we use the CI/CD to can, to have a better workflow, and we we will be able to configure it to run it, and then if you spot something, if it's finished running and it has a report, you will be able to send a Slack message and say, okay, the the report will be available at this page. You can go there and check it, and the result will be like this and like that. So, so that is everything for our presentation today. Do you have any question? Well, then a question for you is, uh, sorry, was there a question? No. no, then a question for you is, are you, are you folks using something similar or something different in your current workflows for regression testing or automated testing? Right now, it's just all manual checklists as well. Yeah. That's why we're here. Yeah, how yeah. we're here. We're awesome. Yeah. We just use in Hat. Okay. And uh, what kind of stuff do you script with Hat? Uh, a lot of behavior uh, tests. Yeah, and we run it. Okay, like us. Cool. Yeah. But that actually, it's pretty hard to debug a uh, test file. Yeah. Because you don't have access to yeah in the environment. And do you also take screenshots uh, as an artifact of the failure in case you get an error? I think that's something that be uh, be had support. Yeah, we have support, but the yeah, all screenshots still are inside of uh, bucket pipelines, and yeah, we don't have access there. Mm -hmm. At least we run test uh, locally. Okay, makes sense. Cool. Anybody else? Uh, other experience with similar tools? Yeah, we use Backstop a lot for police testing or uh, the user side of things. Uh, did you ever try using Playwright for web form or for more of your content managing? The back end? I don't think so, but uh, I uh, I didn't want to cover the back end thing. Yeah, I just want to test the front end as an anonymous user. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like my content people will contact me soon enough if there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, I guess last point, Kevin. What did you do with uh, Backstop? Uh, there is an option in Backstop to pass cookies, so uh, you can. Prepare a script somewhere else to log into the site, get the cookies, and pass that to Backstop. I actually was looking uh, to Backstop GitHub, and I don't know how, but it looks like it could be integrated with Playwright. So, maybe? Uh, I from from what I see from the README of uh, Backstop, uh, the newest version is powered by Playwright Engine. So, at some point, they ported it. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see that there are so many similarities between the two. Yeah. Makes me makes me wonder if we should port side diff onto playwright too, <laughs> but that could be a lot of work. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, any last question? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.